Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Hello, everybody. It's Michael Herbridge. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. We're a couple minutes late. We're having some Facebook issues tonight. So hopefully um, everybody will start coming into the room. We'll take a um, couple minutes here to let everybody get into the room. I'll show you what we're going to be working on tonight. We're going to be doing banding methods. And so this piece here, these fine blue lines along the edges, um, are, are banding. Um, this piece was actually done with the Azure markers, doing banding methods with markers on pottery. And I see people are coming into the room now. That's good. Uh, this piece is done using banding just along the edges of a stamped piece. And this one is a piece that was banded with underglazes. It was banded with black into blue. And then I've got the Spectaclear Stardust on there is that sparkly, glittery um, effect that you see on that piece. This one was actually done on a, I'm going to show you guys tonight on a pottery wheel um, doing banding methods, but this is another technique where you actually spin the piece fast and put the color on and you get the color bursting out. We're not actually going to do that tonight, but that's one other method that you can do. I'm going to set these behind me here and I'll show you a couple other pieces. This is a, a horsehair piece with polished underglaze. And this one was done going from black to gray to white, creating a gradient on this vase. And then I did banding, some fine line banding around the top edge. These two vases were also done with that. This one was purple to pink. The pink is hard to see on here, to white, and then the black on the top. This one was blue, turquoise, white with a banding on the top as well. So I'm going to show you different methods tonight using a banding wheel, and we are going to do it with a pottery wheel as well. Um, I'm sure some people are already typing in mystery box. If you're not familiar with our mystery box, we've got a medium flat rate shipping box here. And if you're interested in purchasing that, we've got one of those tonight. And there's about $100 worth of products in there. And the person whose name is drawn can uh, get that box for $50. And that includes shipping anywhere in the USA. If you're an international customer, um, we would just charge you for the appropriate shipping on there. So if you're international and you win, we will get you a shipping quote on that. Um, what I will tell you about the mystery box, I won't tell you exactly what's in there, but what I can say is it's got a lot to do with what we're doing tonight. So it obviously has something to do with banding methods and has some, some items in there that will get you started with banding. Um, what we're going to do is toward the end of the night, we will draw a name out. My wife Janine is here. She's marking those names down and um, she will have those ready for me to draw one of the names later on. You need to be present to be able to say yes that you do want the mystery box. If for some reason your name is drawn and you don't care for what's in the mystery box once I show it, you can always pass on it and we'll just draw out another name um, for that mystery box. So I'm going to set that down here. And these live recordings um, I've got somebody who's actually taking these and converting them into um, videos that will be put on our website and our YouTube page. So it's going to kind of look silly, but I'm going to kind of re-show a couple of the pieces here and almost like I'm restarting so that the editing goes a lot easier for him. So uh, tonight we're going to be working on banding methods. I'm going to show you how to do fine line banding and we'll talk about different methods where you can get different blends of colors and things as well. So I'm going to flip the camera down here and we're going to talk first about different types of banding wheels. The one that I really like to work with is this one by Shimpo and this banding wheel um, is really heavy duty. I want to say it weighs about 30 pounds. Um, it's nice and heavy and the nice thing is it's really sturdy. I've had this banding wheel for probably 15 years. But once you spin it, it just keeps going. My hands aren't down there having to keep turning this because it's so heavily weighted. Um, you get a nice smooth rotation. Um, sometimes people want to try to band with banding wheels that really aren't banding wheels, like a plastic Lazy Susan that you might have for like spices in your spice rack or something to spin them. If when you turn that, 
it gets like a wobbly vibration that's really not a good wheel to use for banding. This one happens to be one from um, Amico makes these, and these are, are very affordable. They're about $50. Um, they're very affordable. Um, it is a two-piece banding wheel. A lot of times people in workshops, they go to pick this up, they pick it up in the bottom, sticks to it until they get it off the table, and then it pops apart. So I have to remind people that it's two pieces. And this is a great little banding wheel. The nice thing is with this one and with the Shimpo, is that you can get your hands underneath to actually spin the wheel. Um, I'm also going to show you guys tonight how to use um, a pottery wheel for doing banding methods as well. Now, there are other ones like Shimpo or, or Nidic, it's now, makes um, short ones like this. And while these are weighted well, um, you have to kind of reach underneath this way to get your hand under the wheel to spin it, and you kind of have to flick it. And so I tend to not get as even and smooth of a motion as I can get when I'm using this wheel and I can be underneath it going like this spinning that wheel so I'm not flicking it I'm my thumb is kind of pushing this as it as it starts spinning and then I'm just constantly going like this doing that spinning motion of that wheel so my favorite is this higher um, wheel that that Nidic makes most of you probably know that them as Shimpo this little pad that I'm putting on the top of here this is um, a rubber pad that makes it so that pieces will stick it's got a little bit of a tackiness to it when it gets dusty it's not as as tacky but why that's nice is when I put pieces on there and I start spinning them they're not going to want to slide off of the top you can do the same thing by putting a damp paper towel or a damp washcloth or something on there as well um, just to prevent the pieces from sliding because these are metal. Um, the nice thing about the top of the banding wheels is there are lines on them. So whether you use the Amico or the, the, the Nidic one, um, they have lines so that when you set something on there, not that I'm going to paint this bottle of paint, but I can look from the top down and get an idea of how well centered this piece is. Um, when it's something that's bigger than the wheel, it's a little bit harder to see. Um, but I still really like this rubber pad, and I usually put that on there, and I try to kind of center it so that I've got an even amount of space around here, and then I just kind of press it down. I need to make sure that the top of this isn't dusty and that this isn't dusty. If it is, I just wash it off with a damp paper towel or a damp sponge. I'm going to work first on a flat horizontal piece and then I'm going to show you techniques for doing it on a vertical piece. So I'm going to take and I'm going to purposely put this way off center but I'll usually try to stand above it and look straight down at it to try and see um, how well centered it is. Centered it is. Oh the other thing I forgot to mention about the mystery box is we usually go about 10 minutes to 15 minutes in that you can put your name in and then after that we cut that off. So if you haven't put in for mystery box yet, I see Janine still writing over there. Um, she will be done in just a few minutes with that and we'll cut that off. Um, so I'm slowly turning the piece and I'm holding this brush handle next to this and you can see how off center this is and how it rubs on this brush handle. So what I'm gonna do is where it rubs on the brush handle, I'm going to stop it, and I'm going to slide the piece the opposite direction. And I'll just continue to do that until we get this piece well centered. Now, sometimes people will think, well, I'm off by an inch, so they move the plate over an inch, and then it's like they never get centered, and they just are like, why won't this center? So if you move it over, if you're off an inch, and you move it an inch, it's going to shift it too far the other way. You need to go about half the distance. So I went about a half an inch here, and as I turn it now, I still am off center a little bit, so I'm just going to move this over slightly. And sometimes pieces will be a little bit warped, and so it's hard to get them perfectly centered. Um, and I think we've got this pretty close now. Yeah, this is pretty good. Now, I'm going to work with different colors. I'm going to work with um, Mako's fundamental underglazes on some of these techniques and I'm going to work with 
that bottle's really dirty. Get one here that's not covered with slip on my hands. Um, we're going to work with Colors for Earth's color concentrates. The difference between these products, the Mako Fundamental Underglazes are a clay-based product. So they are basically colored clay. And for solid coverage, you generally put on three coats of that color. The color concentrates are basically pigment. They're not a clay-based or a slip-based product. So they are super concentrated color. Um, these are wonderful for blending, making blends of colors. I'll show you how to make a, a blend between the colors, and then I'll show you how to do more defined colors, and then how to do fine lines. And so the color concentrates work really well um, for all over coverage, creating blends, and for doing that fine line work because they're so concentrated. When I do those fine lines on the edge, I only have to go over it once or twice um, and, and the colors are usually diluted when I'm doing that as well. So um, while this may look like a, a little two ounce bottle and you may think it's not gonna go real far, you'll be surprised how far that color goes and how bright and vibrant those colors are. The fundamental underglazes, sometimes I use those on pieces like my horsehair pieces, these were done using the fundamental underglazes because I like to do a polished underglaze on my horsehair pieces. Um, some people will do like a, a terra sige on their pieces. Um, fundamental underglazes, because they're clay based, I can put those on and I can polish them and get really nice finishes. But then things like the black lines on there, I went back and I used the color concentrates for that. Duncan also makes Easy Strokes and Mako took over manufacturing the Duncan products. Um, and, and they are manufacturing quite a few of the colors again, um, but it is kind of limited. So if you're looking for a really big palette of color, the color concentrates have a really broad range of colors. So on this first piece, we're actually gonna work with the color concentrates and I'm going to take, and I've got this palette, and I showed this in one of my other lives, where it's got these compartments in it. And so I had used this in one other live with my color concentrates. And the nice thing about them is I can put those in this empty palette, and even if they dry up, I add a little bit of water to those, and I can dilute them. They're kind of like watercolor on ceramics. And so um, I'm going to put some of these colors into these little slots in here. Now we're going to thin these colors down as well, but I'm going to do that over in another area here. The other thing with the color concentrates is they're kind of a, a gel base color, and so the more you shake them, the more diluted they become. They're, if I just squeeze this out without shaking it, it would be real thick like a gel, and so I want to really shake them well to agitate them and get those color to get that color uh, more fluid well where do you get the sticky pads so the sticky pads the banding wheels um the color concentrates all of these products are available on my website learnfiredarts.com and um i'm going to talk tonight about the um uh, Black Friday specials that we're going to be having. So um, we're going to have a whole bunch of different uh, Black Friday specials, and it's going to be all mystery boxes. So as much as you guys love mystery boxes, and a lot of you want to always get in on the mystery boxes, you can actually uh, do that. This Friday, we're going to have dozens of different mystery box specials um, on the website. So hang around tonight after we're done with this live. Um, I'm going to show you guys a preview of some of the uh, live or the, the mystery box specials that we're going to have this weekend. All right. So I think um, that we did cut off just a, a minute ago. Anybody entering their name? If your name is in there, Janine is still going to write it down if you got it in before. Um, the time was up on there. So, but if anybody enters it, and if you guys are watching this as a recording, don't put in mystery box because we're going to draw for it at the end of the live. And I always kind of giggle. People start watching the recording and don't realize necessarily that it's a recording and they're putting mystery box, mystery box. And it's like, 
yeah, you're not going to get the mystery box at this point because it's it's over. So, oh, there's another question. Oh. Can they be fired to coincide? So. Yeah, and all of the, the colors, the fundamental underglazes and the color concentrates can go to a cone 5.6 and Colors for Earth does have on their website a color chart that shows the colors fired to cone 5.6. Um, some of the colors, things like reds, stay really nice and bright and vibrant red. Um, some of the colors will change slightly. And so you want to look at that color chart. And I keep forgetting, I don't think I've put it up on our website. And every time I use those colors, I always think I got to go in and check because I do have a document for that to, to share. So there are different types of brushes that you can work with for banding techniques. And for doing this blend on here, um, I like to work with soft bristled fan brushes. I like to work with mop brushes. Um, and I was expecting somebody would ask about doing banding with products like Stroke and Coat and Concepts. And while those colors will work, because they are frit-based color and they're kind of gritty, um, when you do banding and you dilute them with water and you do your banding on your piece, a lot of times they kind of get chalky and you get kind of a, a buildup of the frit on there and it's hard to get real even coverage when you're banding with them. So um, I really prefer not to use those products. I, I like those products, but for this technique, I'm not as crazy about it because it does tend to kind of build up on the brush. And then when you lift the brush, you've got kind of a line of gritty kind of frit from that. Just moving all this stuff over so it's on the, the right side here. So I'm going to take a little bit of water and I'm going to put it in these little compartments here. You could do this in a, a little plastic cup or something, but I'm going to dilute my first couple colors here. So I'm going to use my fan brush and I'm going to start out with the yellow and I'm just going to dilute this and it's about 50% water to 50% color. And I'm going to use this soft synthetic fan brush and I'm going to start doing my banding. Now, if you're not comfortable with banding and it's your first time doing it, just take a brush and water Get my water back in the, the screen here and water and when you start turning your wheel your banding wheel so i'm reaching underneath like i showed you guys with my thumb and my index finger and i'm going to start the spinning i'm right-handed so i'm going to be holding the brush with my right hand i'm turning the wheel with my left hand and um the wheel is going away from me so i'm holding the brush in the direction that the wheel is turning. If I turn the wheel toward myself and I touch this brush down, it's just going to make the brush go kind of funky and wonky on there. So I want to have the brush aiming in the direction that the wheel is turning. So if you're not used to banding and you want to practice, a great way to do it is just to go with water on the brush. Because look, when I go on bisque and I lay this brush on there and I pull it out, I get a darker area where the water shows up so i can practice with water um, i'm going to show you guys how to do fine lines using dagger brushes and so if i want to practice with the dagger the dagger <clears throat> is a little more challenging i can take that dagger and touch that down and practice with water getting fine lines and that water is just going to evaporate and, and dry up on there now there does come a point where when you get the piece so incredibly wet that you may need to let the piece dry for a little while. So I don't want to get this piece too wet, but now that I've added some water to it, I would normally go with a damp sponge over my piece. Um, and I did that earlier to this piece, but I'm just going to take and add a little bit of water. And by dampening this, it's going to accomplish a couple things. It'll get rid of any dust that's on the piece. But because on this one, I want to do a blend of color where it's going to go from yellow to red to, I think we'll use purple or dark blue on there. Um, by dampening it, it's going to allow the colors to kind of stay open a little bit longer. They won't dry as quickly. So I've got my yellow mixed up here and I'm going to load up this fan brush. And you want to be careful that you don't have so much color in the brush that as you lift over the piece that you have color dripping onto it. So I kind of drag this a little bit on the side and then I touch this down in the middle of my plate 
and I keep the wheel turning. Now, how fast should you turn the wheel? Um, you don't want to go so slow that um, it, the speed of this, I mean, my finger is just kind of constantly going like this, keeping this wheel spinning. Um, if I go too slow, I probably won't get as smooth of a finish on there, and I might have a, a tendency to, to want to move the brush. If you notice, when I touch this brush down, I'm not pulling the brush toward myself this way, and that's something really common that I see is people will pull the brush toward themselves. That brush is staying in this spot as it turns. Now, I've got my hand, I'm just holding my hand free here. Um, sometimes I will, with beginners, or sometimes with myself, I'll put something next to it to, to anchor my hand on. So I've got a roll of paper towel here that I can use, or it might be a box or a stack of books, so that your hand can be steady. That's really important when you're doing the fine lines on these pieces. Someone is wondering if this would work with acrylic paint. Yep, you can do the same technique with acrylic paint. The thing with acrylic is when you dilute it, it doesn't dry as fast as the underglazes um, will tend to. And so um, you just have to kind of work with it. It'll just be a little bit different doing it with acrylics. So I'm going out further than I want the yellow to be. I want my yellow to probably come to about here. So I've gone about an inch beyond there. And then I'm going to go with, I'm just going to rinse this brush out. I'm going to pick up the orange. We're going to do a little bit of orange. So I'm going to mix the orange in my other compartment here. And I'm going to go, and I'm not going to start on top of the yellow. I'm going to go just outside of the yellow and add some of the orange and then I will slowly once I get a good layer of this on here I will go back and I will overlap the yellow to get more of a blend and then it's a matter of kind of working back and forth between the yellow and the orange to get a blend. I'm going to mix up a little bit more of the orange here. And now this is where I'll start to go back and overlap the yellow. And I want to kind of work wet into wet. And because I'm talking a lot as I do this, the yellow got pretty dry. But I would normally kind of work quickly into the, the orange overlapping the yellow. Mix up a little bit more here. so that I get a gradual blend. Now, if you want real defined lines, that's what I'm going to do on the next piece is not have a blend like this. But I really like these blends. And the nice thing with the color concentrates is they're not permanent until you fire them. So even if I don't get a good blend between here, um, I can just go back with a wet brush and get that blend. Now I'm mixing up a little bit more of the yellow, and I'm going to take that and kind of overlap the orange a little bit and just kind of hold the brush in that area where those two colors, and I'm slowly bringing that brush back into the yellow. And, and then I kind of lift quickly on the brush. I don't want to stop the banding wheel and then lift the brush because sometimes you'll get kind of a puddle of color behind the brush. And now I'm going to go into, you no, know I'm going to do red on the edge of this. So I'm going to mix up some of my red, dilute it here, load up that brush, and I'm going to take that along this outside edge of this plate. Again, I'm not really going over the orange at this point. I want to get my red nice and bright on this edge. before I start overlapping. Oh, is it food safe? These, yeah, these colors, I mean, they're, they're you could eat these colors. They're non-toxic, so you could eat it. I wouldn't suggest that. It probably doesn't taste very good. But yes, it is food safe um, if you use a food safe glaze on top. So because these color concentrates are basically just pigment, they're not fritted. And so when I talk about products like stroke and coat and concepts, um, 
because they are fritted, if you put three coats on, you don't need a, a clear glaze over it. Because these are just pigment and there's no frit in it, this piece needs to be clear glaze. So as long as the glaze that you use over it is food safe, um, you're fine to, um, to eat off of these pieces. Now I've got, this plate has been used about 20 times to do banding techniques. And I'm not sure on the camera, you can see a little bit of the streakiness along this edge here, where I've kind of got a, a hard spot or a hot spot. So I'm going to go with just some color that's not real diluted. And I'm going to see if I can kind of cover that hot spot. Um, if I can't get it to cover, what I would probably do is um, sand this piece a little bit before I would do um, my banding technique on here. And I did sand this, but I'm not sure that I sanded it good on the edges because every time I wash this off, it kind of polishes the piece. So now I'm going to dilute the red again. And now this is where I'm going to overlap the orange a little bit and get kind of a blend between the red and the orange. And again, I talked and hesitated and paused. And so the orange got a little bit dry. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to do my red. And then I'm going to mix up a little bit more orange here and quickly kind of take that and overlap on the red and kind of hold that brush there to get more of a gradual fade from yellow to red. How many coats are you doing? You know, it's, it's probably about two to three coats of diluted color. So it's about a coat and a half. It's really about how bright you want it to be because you're diluting the color. Um, it's going to be a little more translucent on there. And so that's why you saw me going over it multiple times to get nice, um, nice coverage on there with the color, but it's totally up to you. Some people want more of a washed out streaky look. Now I'm going to use, and I could use the color concentrates, but I talked a little bit about, oops, Duncan easy strokes. And I just got a little chunk of black on there, which is okay because it, it'll it's dry. Um, I'm going to use this to do the banding. Colors for Earth does have a black as well, and I'm going to use a dagger brush to show this this technique. Now a lot of people think when they're going to do fine lines, they think of a liner brush, and I've got all different samples here of, oops, liner brushes. I've got the daggers in here too. Let me pull those out. So these are different liner brushes and liners are designed for doing long continuous lines. And these will work on a banding wheel. The problem is most of them don't hold enough color to really do long continuous lines. And so even this one that's a little bit fuller bodied, I think I can just flake off that chunk of black. There we go. Um, that's got a fuller body on it this will run out of color rather quickly and especially shorter liners or synthetic gold Taclon liners, even the fabulous fine point liner, this holds a lot of color, but it will run out of color quicker than a dagger brush. And so daggers kind of look a little bit like an angular, but they're a lot longer. And the nice thing with the dagger is they come to a really nice point. They hold a lot of color in their body and you'll find different sizes in different hair types. So the Menta ones that we sell on LearnFiredArts.com, um, these are a real soft synthetic. Those are going to hold even more color than the uh, Moderna series that is a gold Taclon. Um, the advantage to gold Taclon is it holds its shape better and you can get a crisper edge. Most people feel more comfortable when they first start banding using a gold Taclon bristle because it holds a really nice edge on the brush. Where the um, Mento one, what I really like about that is the massive amounts of color that it will hold, but it's a lot floppier bristle. So some people have a harder time controlling that. I really love the Mento brushes are my favorite, but I find in workshops, a lot of times most people are more comfortable with the gold Taclon version. And basically, the, the sizes of these, and I'm going to use the large Menta brush here, um, is how much color it will hold. And so you want to utilize the belly of that brush, and I'm going to thin the black down here as well. You want to utilize that belly of that brush to hold all of that color. Now, this is where I'm going to put my roll of paper towel here to balance my hand. 
Here too, you want to be careful that you don't have so much color in there that the color is going to drip on your piece. So a lot of times I'll kind of shake the brush a little bit over my palette or I'll kind of pat it out to get um, any real excess drips of color out of the brush because it, it does hold so much. Then I want to balance my hand and I want to start the piece turning. I still have too much color in here. I want to start the piece turning and have that brush angled in that direction. And as I touch the brush down on here, I want to just be looking where the brush is touching. By anchoring your hand on a roll of paper towel or something, it also makes it so that you don't have a tendency to pull the brush toward yourself. I see this in workshops all the time. People start out with a brush here, and then they start pulling the brush. The brush just goes straight down. It has that angle to it that will fit the contour of the piece. And as that starts turning and you gently touch that brush down, you'll get a nice line. And then lift and let the wheel slowly come to a stop. Don't try to really quickly stop it because sometimes your piece will want to shift and slide off of the piece. Now, when I do the very outside edge of the piece, I usually start with an inside line like this. So I get a nice crisp line. If I try to start on the outside edge, sometimes when those pieces are a little warped, that brush kind of goes up the side, down the side, up the side, down the side, and it's hard to get a nice crisp line. So I'll usually start in a little bit, and then I'll go and fill in going out to the outside edge of the piece. Another couple questions. Okay. Um, would you redo the orange if it had not dried? Would I redo the orange if it had not dried? So if the orange had not dried, um, I still would have gone with a little bit of orange to overlap the red so that I get that graduated blend of color. Yes, I, I probably would have still gone with the orange to blend it into the red. Um, are color concentrates affected by freezing temperatures like glazes are? You know, a lot of people think that, that glazes freezing is the end of the world and it's going to ruin the glazes. Most of the glaze manufacturers make them so that if they do freeze in shipping, it's not a problem. You want to naturally let the colors thaw. You don't want to try to force it with any type of heat. Um, but generally, it's really not a problem if the colors do freeze. Products that shouldn't freeze are like wax resist and masking products. Those will not work well um, when they've been frozen. So I kind of worked my way filling that in working my way out onto the outside of the piece. And again, I'm going to go over this enough times to make sure that that black is nice and solid and not streaky. Now I can go back and I can add some inside lines. There's one other question. Can a detail be added in the middle with this method? Can a detail be added in the middle? Yeah. Um like doing some type of a design in the middle or if I want to do some some banding I can go and do these lines out here with the brush and I can also take I'm just going to add a little bit more black to this edge on here and I can take this and if I want to go with some red in the middle I can dilute some of this red can load up the belly of my brush and I can do lines with red in the middle and you can see how much color this brush holds that I don't need to be dipping in and reloading this constantly to add these lines on here um, so that's you know the, the dagger brushes really versus a liner brush really do work well for this and I'll be honest, some of you are like, oh my God, he makes it look so easy. And people say that in workshops all the time. And it, when I first learned to do this, I didn't sit down. And the first time I did it, I had perfect lines. But what I did is I took these brushes, I took a banding wheel, and I practiced with water on pieces. And after doing a lot of practicing with water, then I felt comfortable enough that I went back and I, I loaded the brush up with paint. And the hardest part is first touching that brush down on the piece because you're afraid you're going to mess it up and you just have to be confident but if you do mess it up take a sponge wipe it off and start over it's it it takes practice 
It's not going to happen instantly. It's rare that I get somebody that the first time they do it, they're like, oh, yeah, this is easy, no problem, and, and they have it perfectly. What you don't want to do is ever move this piece until you are done with it. And so um, if you have to, for some reason, pick it up or move it, um, to get that centered exactly and to be able to go back and do lines again, it's highly unlikely that you get it centered exactly the same. And that's one of the reasons, too, I like that rubber pad under there, because that prevents the piece from shifting and sliding. If you don't have something underneath there, there's a good chance as you start this turning or you bump it even slightly, your piece is going to shift and you're going to have a hard time finishing um, the lines and getting them to, to match up on there. So I am done with this piece. I'm going to pop this off of the banding wheel and set this aside. Okay. Um, you sell the white sand brush, correct? Yep. Okay. Four different sizes. And will the Sumi brushes work for banding? Sumi brushes are, are nice brushes, um, and they should work for banding um, because the Sumi brushes will generally come to a nice point. They have a nice belly on them that they will hold a lot of color. Um, you just, they're not angled like a dagger. And so as you bring, and I don't have a Sumi brush here, but a Sumi brush, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's kind of like, think about like a bamboo brush. I might have a bamboo, I do have a bamboo brush here. So Sumi brushes are kind of like a bamboo brush. And so they're around that come to a nice point. And so as I take this brush and I touch this down on the piece, it will hold color. But you have to be careful because if you press a little bit too hard, all of a sudden you're getting a thicker line. And so it, it's a little bit more challenging to keep that nice smooth line on there. But yes, a Sumi brush, um, practice with that. That should probably work as well. Could you show how you hold the brush? I can. Let me get this piece. There was a word oh. from that question, but I'm guessing that's what they meant. I set this piece on here, and it's actually centered. Okay, and then there was something about that. Um, if the piece or plate gets off-centered, would you recenter it or finish as it is? If it goes off-center, I pretty much am done with it at that point. Um, what you can do is you can put that piece, you know, try to center it again, and then just kind of hold the brush head above a line and turn it kind of slowly and see if you're you're matched up um, and if you have to shift it over but it's really hard to center it exactly the same as it was originally so it's really important to not bump the piece or move the piece until you are done with it so question was can you show how you hold the brush so I'm holding the brush like if I was doing brush strokes um, if I was probably holding a chopstick if I was holding a pen or a pencil, yeah, I mean, it's kind of the same. And I'm, I'm holding it like this. And as that wheel starts turning, then I touch the brush down. I've got my arm anchored over here on my roll of paper towel. And so it's just important to have that brush aiming in the direction that the piece is going. The big problem that I have is people start going like this, and they start pulling the brush toward themselves. And all of a sudden, they get back here and look at, the brush is on its side. You're, you're basically using the tip of that brush to get your fine lines. I can get, even with this big brush, I can get a very, very fine, fine line just using the tip of the brush. And I'm just touching it down. I am looking exactly where that brush is touching. I'm not taking my head and spinning like the piece because you'll just get dizzy if you do that. Um, so utilize the belly of that brush to hold the color and use the point of it. Now, I can take the same brush, and instead of fine lines, I can get thicker lines just by pressing down a little bit harder with that brush. And so that brush is down like this as it's going instead of just the tip of it hitting. There's a couple of people who are wondering if they could do this on their um, pottery wheel. Yeah, and I'm going to show that in a little bit. I've got a pottery wheel sitting here, and I'm going to show you how to do that because part of the the thing with using a banding wheel is that motion of this hand turning it and then the other hand doing something else it's kind of like patting your head and rubbing your tummy um it's it's doing two different things and it's training yourself and so i always tell people get comfortable spinning the wheel before you even pick up the brush 
and then get comfortable with that spinning motion and then pick up your brush and touch your brush down. And, and again, practice with water. It's the best way um, to do this. So on this piece, now that I've gotten it wet, I'm just going to go over again and kind of get the whole piece dampened. Um, this one, I'm not going to do a blend of color. I'm going to do solid sections of color on here, more of a def defined line. So on this one, I'm going to work with, I've got a, a lighter blue here that I'm going to take and I'm going to dilute in a puddle over here. And now, instead of going from light blue to dark blue to purple, I'm going to do a section on here that's going to be all light blue. Again, I'm going to start in the middle, work my way out. It looks a little off-centered from our view, but not much. Is it okay to be a little off-centered? Yeah, and sometimes pieces are warped a little bit. So as I hold the brush against here, there is one little section where it, it rubs a little bit. And so it's okay to be off a little bit but always try to center the best that you can. So I want this light blue to go out about this far. So I'm going to just apply this color in here and I'm slowly dragging the brush out, but I'm going to end with a pretty solid edge on there. Then I'm going to go into my next color I'm going to dilute that. And then I'm going to start and touch right next to where that color ends. And if I overlap it, it's fine. But I'm not going to overlap and try to create a blend. I want a very defined darker blue next to my lighter blue. And then I'm now I'm working on the other edge of this blue. And sometimes if I need a nice edge, instead of laying the brush flat, I can kind of hold it up on its chisel edge and get a nice crisp line if I find that the brush is kind of skipping across on the piece a little bit and then I can go back and fill in the rest of that with more of that blue and then I'm going to go into the purple dilute that and I'm going to use this on the outside edge and so as I start this edge I'm going to hold it up on its chisel edge. Is there a certain number of revolution to get to use to get the color you want? No, it's really, I just kind of watch and I look for the amount of coverage that I want. If I wanted, I'm going to dilute this way down. I can create more of a washed out effect on this purple just by using more water. So right now it's kind of streaky looking. I can just go with water on that brush and I can work to dilute this color a little bit more. Because again, these colors aren't permanent until you fire them. So it's kind of like watercolor on here that I can go over and I can kind of dilute this and get um, a lighter, more translucent effect. This plate too has been, been cleaned off numerous times. And I've got some areas on the edge here that are a little polished that the color isn't sticking very well. I go along with a little bit less diluted color. I usually end up covering that with the black anyway. But here you can see I've got a defined light blue, dark blue, purple. And then I can go back and I can use, you know, you don't have to do your edges necessarily or your lines with black. I can go back with this purple, for example, and in between where the two blues meet, and again, I'm going to grab my roll of paper towel to anchor here. I can go and create a line of purple in between those colors. 
Yes. If we use un underglazes, do they need to be thinned down? Um, I'm going to use the UG, the cover coat, or the the fundamental underglazes, which would be the equivalent of Duncan cover coat, and I'm going to use that on, on the, the last piece that I'm going to show you guys on the pottery wheel here in a minute. Um, and, and yes, if you're doing a blend, they need to be thinned if you're trying to go um, to a, a blend on there. Grab some black here. And I can add, so I did a purple line. I can add a fine black line on each side of that purple. I can do other little fine lines. Again, look at how much color this brush holds. And again, I'm just looking straight down where the brush is touching. I'm not moving my head and looking all around the plate as I turn this. Get a little bit more black here. Um, I have a... Let's see. That doesn't look like a great... It says that doesn't look like a great fan brush for this. Probably better with a fluffier fan brush. I don't know. Did you use a fan brush at one point? Yeah, in this I was using a smaller <laughs> fan brush, and I've got larger sizes here, but I'm saving those to use on the um, vase that I'm going to be doing next. So yeah, yeah a fluffy, a very, you know, a brush, you want a brush that's going to hold a lot of color. If it doesn't hold a lot of color, you're going to be constantly reloading that brush to be able to cover the area and depending how big you are, when I'm doing really big 20-inch bowls, I'm using, I'm going to show you guys using a mop brush as well on the next piece. Um, I'm going to um, use, you can use really big brushes when I'm doing really big 20-inch bowls and things. All right. Um, someone asked, so, so their banding wheel does not have the tall arm. Is there any way to use it for this technique anyway? Well, if you've got a low banding wheel like this, what you have to do is you have to reach underneath here and go like this and kind of flick it to get it to spin. Um, so it will work, but you just don't get as smooth of a motion as you get when you do um, this technique or when you use a, a wheel that you can get your hand underneath. And then you mentioned you sanded it first is this to get the paint to stick better or give it more detail now when i talked about sanding this these plates i've used to demonstrate banding at shows and in workshops and stuff and so i'm constantly washing these off and what ends up happening is the piece kind of gets polished from scrubbing so much and so i'll usually take a sanding pad um, one of these sanding blocks and i will kind of sand the piece down to kind of rough it up again and to kind of open up the pores on the piece. And so if I don't sand it all really well, I get areas where the, the color doesn't want to stick very well. Now I'm using a stiff bristle, the hog bristled fan brush. I've loaded it up with some diluted black and I'm going to take my finger and I'm going to pull up on the bottom of the bristle and kind of flick it back at the piece to get that light speckling. I, I like to add a little bit of speckling to a lot of my pieces for a couple of reasons. Um, I like the look of that and it also disguises any little, sometimes as you're coming across you get a little drip of black in the middle of your piece and you know now what do you do? So speckling disguises a lot of things. I think it adds to the design and so it's just a light flicking of that bristle to get that color to speckle back. If you have too much color in the brush, you're going to get big blobs. So practice your speckling off to the side on other pieces so that you get a nice light speckle over your finish. And this piece eventually is probably going to get washed off and it'll be used again. I can do the same thing. I can do the, the speckling on this piece. Um, you get the idea with that. So I'm going to set these banding wheels aside. And I've got a pottery wheel here that I'm going to lift up on my workspace. And I'm going to show you guys how to do banding on a vertical piece. Set these colors aside. And again, the nice thing with this is 
I'll probably wash these areas out this color but I can let these colors dry up in here and just go back later and add water to these let them sit even after they're dried up mix them and they will work just like a watercolor pad and I do sell those on my website of course as well all right so I've got in my studio I've got a nice big um, pottery wheel but I sell these on my website and this is um, a nice portable wheel that that Nita Chimpo makes um, it's called um, the Aspire wheel it comes with there's an optional foot pedal that you can get with this and I recommend a foot pedal if you don't have a potter's wheel and you're looking at getting one this is a really nice beginner wheel um, you can center up to 25 pounds of clay on here which most beginners they may have aspirations to center like 100 pounds of clay but trust me you're not going to be centering 100 pounds of clay if you're just starting to, to throw on a wheel even proficient wheel artists have a hard time centering 100 pounds of clay and so I've seen people use more than 25 pounds on here but it's rated at 25 pounds it does have nice bats that come with it these are nice plastic bats they have little rubber gaskets in here that hook well onto the pins and stay on there nice um, it has a removable splash pan so that just turns and can be lifted off and easily put in the sink and washed out and just turns to go back on and it has kind of this area where the motor is and this actually is a really nice area you've got two levels where you can balance your hand to be able to do your banding so you might have to turn the wheel to put your hand up here and to be able to angle in on the piece but that foot pedal will allow you to control this with your foot and so when I was talking about with the banding wheel how you have to spin it and touch your brush down with this your foot is controlling the speed so as I press this pedal down that wheel can go at different speeds the more I press it down the faster it's going to go now I wouldn't want to go that fast because there's a good chance I'd fling my piece off and so you have to be kind of careful with that but I'm going to put the foot pedal down here by my foot if you don't get the foot pedal there is a lever that would be on the side here that you can adjust to control the speed on there but I, I really like the um, the foot pedal because I don't have to sit there and try to 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 adjust that um, with this hand while my hand is up here with with the brush on it I'm going to put my pad on here and again with this I'll try to kind of center this I'm gonna hair on here and I want to press that down so that it sticks well and then I've got a vase here that I'm going to be working with and so I want to try to set that on the wheel so that it's centered and I'm going to turn this a little bit because my plan was to bring the camera down so that it can see actually I'll put the, the camera back here and I think it should work um, to show you where the brush is touching on here and use this banding wheel set up this stand here I'm just going to move the camera I don't want to make everybody dizzy but so this is my my vase I'm going to try to get this centered the best that I can on here and I don't want to go too fast with this because I don't want to fling the vase off and so that's one of the things that you just kind of have to get used to with this I'm going to go slow wherever it touches my finger I'm going to stop it shift it over a little bit and then you'll see I kind of push it down to make sure that it's it's stuck well to the rubber pad that's on here Move close and the nice thing with this too is when you when you go to the full off with the potter's wheel it pretty much almost stops instantly and this is pretty good for the blending technique that we're going to do on here um, I'm going to work with 
some of Mako's um, UG underglaze. So now this is where, whoops, I'm holding it up to the overhead camera. Um, this is the, the UG underglaze. So these are the clay-based underglazes. So things like Duncan has cover coats. Mako um, has the, the fundamentals. Um, Duncan had cover coats, which aren't currently being manufactured anymore, but you may have those. Those are, and, and Amico has their LUG underglazes as well. And those are all some form of like a clay base product. And the reason I like that on here is when I do like the horsehair pieces, is I mentioned earlier that I um, want to be able to do a polished underglaze. Now on this one, I'm going to use the larger fan brushes, and I'm going to have a fan brush for each color that I work with because I'm again going to be working wet into wet. So I've got those three brushes, and then I've got a couple of mop brushes here. And these are um, synthetic Menta mop brushes. Um, goat hair, sometimes the white mop brushes you'll see are goat hair, and those will work as well. But the goat hair tends to shed more, and so sometimes you'll get hairs in there which will burn away, but where you're doing a graduated color and it's clay-based, if that bristle is embedded in that glaze, when it burns away, the hair will burn away, but it can leave a little bit of a ridge there um, and a little bit of texture. So the synthetics don't tend to shed as much, so I like these for using with a blending. And I want those to be dry, not wet. So that's one of the reasons I wasn't using those earlier. And I'm going to... You oh. sell those rubber pads, right? Yep, the rubber they, pads they are... They don't come in multiple sizes, right? Just no, I just have that one size of, of that rubber pad. So I'm going to pour a little bit of the purple underglaze in a bowl here, and I'm going to pour some of the white. We're just going to do a gradient of, of two colors. Well, could you use a bit of raw clay to hold it? You could use some raw clay. The thing with using raw clay is you have to keep shifting the clay as you're trying to center the piece. Um, when I do that spin technique where I put the piece on there and I put the color on and it sprays out, I will often use um, raw clay to hold those pieces on because I don't want them to fly off of the piece or off of the wheel. Someone else wants to know if you use speed, ever use speedball. Speedball, you know, I haven't used their colors, but they do have underglazes, and I know artists that, that use them and like them, and so I have nothing nothing against their color or anything. Um, all right, I'm aiming up toward the top of the piece. Now I'm using the underglaze straight out of my cup, and so I've loaded up this large fan brush, and I'm going to just take that brush and lay it against the side of the piece, and I'm going to turn it a fairly steady speed, Again, I don't want to get going too fast with this, but I have not diluted this color because this is basically slip. It's underglaze. And so I want to apply this color. And, and you'll see I've kind of taken the color off that side of the brush. You'll see me often flip the brush over, and I kind of deposit the color from the other side of the brush. In this, too, I want to work kind of wet into wet. And so I usually will start with the color working down from the top. And this is a three coat underglaze. So I want to put the equivalent of three coats because I have not diluted this color. I don't need to dilute this color. And I'm laying this on kind of heavy like I would if I was putting a layer of this underglaze or a layer of glaze on a piece. And the reason I start at the top and work my way to the bottom is I'm eventually going to switch to purple to get that gradient blend on here. And so I want my color to be wettest where my brush is right now so that when I go into the purple and bring it up into that, this color should be wetter than probably at the top of the piece. And I'm not really, I'm not letting the color necessarily dry in between each coat completely, but I know that I'm using the color and I'm not pressing hard. I know that I'm laying the color on here nice and thick. So I've got about three coats of color. And so I'm gonna leave this brush sitting in the white 
and I'm going to take a second brush and I'm going to use it with my purple and then I'm going to start at the very bottom of the piece applying my purple so it's going to get all over my oops my pad as well let me turn the camera down here so you can see oops the bottom of the piece now so I'm kind of taking this brush and on this piece I'm working it on the bottom of the piece to get the purple and then I'm going to work my way up toward the white and I'm not I've got my foot off of the foot pedal because this is like an ideal speed to work at and so now I can really just concentrate on my color application and I'm not worried about spinning the banding wheel and I'm going to take this purple right up to the edge of the white and while this is still kind of wet I want to get most of the color off of the brush deposited on the piece and then I'm going to just kind of take that brush and overlap the white and let it kind of deposit some of the purple into the white and then I'm going to take that brush with more white and I'm going to apply that over the top of that purple and I'm just going to kind of hold it in that area I just had a drip of white come off of the brush unfortunately based on the shape of this piece it fell on the, the top of the wheel but I kind of hold it in that area long enough that the purple and the white kind of blend together and then while that white is wet I'm going to take the purple right up to that edge again and then I'm going to take and overlap it with the white and my goal here is to get and I go back then to the white and just kind of work this area and get this color kind of wet into wet blended and the brush will kind of skip across this piece as you're doing that and once I feel a nice smooth motion I'm going to take that dry mop brush and I'm going to hold it right in the middle of where those two colors meet up and the purple should be wet enough and the white should be wet enough that I can get these two colors to blend together if it's too dry and I can't get a blend I can go back with a little bit of the purple redeposit some on the piece and I can take a little bit more white kind of take that down over the purple a little bit and then take that mop brush and now I'm using the other side of the mop brush that's clean and I'm just holding that where those two colors meet and I'll take it down a little bit and maybe up a little bit I'm just slowly kind of blending those two colors wet into wet and the reason I have a couple mop brushes there is so that if I have to go back again and do any more blending um, I've got another dry brush to be able to go over I wouldn't want a wet brush because if I introduce water into there it's just going to dilute the color and that color is going to um, just kind of get mushy and kind of run on that piece but you can see the the blend of color now I'm going to take my dagger and I can add some lines to this piece I have enough space here to have this out here too yeah, find my water and this piece is still pretty wet um, but when I go to add lines to this looking to see if I can find where there's a nice dry area it's pretty dry up toward the top so I'm going to start it turning kind of slowly again and then I'm going to anchor my arm on the side of this wheel and I can take that brush and touch it down to get my lines and you'll see I don't just touch the brush down instantly and lift it real quickly um, I kind of hold it there for a little bit until 
I get a nice smooth line. So that's basically working with the, the underglazes, um, working with the one strokes and all those different types of products on there. Got any questions? No, actually, I haven't done that. All right, let me lift the camera back up here, get it back in the stand. Yep, I was going to say we'll do the mystery box and then I'm going to show you guys a preview of the <clears throat> Black Friday mystery boxes that we've got here. Someone earlier asked what the mystery box was all about, so I, and I told them that I'd have you explain if you had time. But, um, maybe if you want to just go over that. Yeah, so as I'm drawing. So the way the mystery box works is the first about 10, 15 minutes of the live event. You can say that you're interested in the mystery box. The mystery box is a flat rate shipping box, a medium flat rate that's full of goodies. And tonight's mystery box has a lot to do with what we were doing tonight. And so my wife, Janine, puts everybody's names in a little bowl. And then I'm mixing these up. I'm going to flip the camera down here as I mix these up. And I draw a name out. And whoever's name I draw, they can purchase the mystery box for $50, and that includes shipping anywhere in the USA, and there's usually over $100 worth of stuff in there. person needs to be present. If they're international, um, they can get the mystery box for the 50 but then they pay the difference in, in shipping. So I'm going to draw a name out here. And if this person is not present, oh my gosh, this is so funny. This is the same person that won during our last live, and she wasn't present, I'm almost sure. Ann Carruthers. Oh. If Ann is be. in here, Ann, type in so that Janine sees that you are in here during the live. If Ann is not here, we will draw if she doesn't respond within yeah, a, I never did a ask couple you minutes. What happened with that? Did the second or third person? It was actually we went to the third person that night. Oh really? Yeah. The second person never. Okay. Yep. Now. The second person hadn't responded, and actually that just shipped out today. Okay, real um, quick while we're waiting for Anne, um, mm -hmm. did you say you would burnish this and do a raku horse horse hair firing with it? Yeah, so this piece using the underglaze, then I will will polish that with a a polishing cloth, or you can burnish it with a wooden spoon or something, um, and I'll use that for horse hair firing. And so that's how I get the colorful finishes that I have on my pieces. So this one is the purple with a the graduation. There was actually pink in here, and it doesn't show up well on the camera. It goes from purple to pink to white, and that's what I use for my horse hair pieces. All right, has Anne typed in yet that Anne is in here? Mm -hmm. If Anne is not in here, we're going to have to draw another name. I haven't seen her. Okay. A couple other people have said congrats to her. But okay, well, if Anne is if not in here, and yep, you got to stay for the whole live, so we're going to draw another name out. If Anne happens to have typed in a comment that she is here, before we do this next name. If we, um, if we see it at some point, we'll... we'll yeah. Patty Peterson, or Pedersen. If Patty, if you are in here, let us know that you are in here. <laughs> well, Richard said he's here. <laughs> I'm sure there's lots of people who are willing to <laughs> to take it, so I'm going to put Anne aside here. Unless, is Richard with Anne? No, I don't, I don't know. I... No, we actually need to see the, the <laughs> person see who's... Anne, well, maybe her computer died. She can say she's in. Yeah. Just says I'm here. <laughs> All right. So, Patty, if you're in here, let us know so we can open up the mystery box. If we don't hear from Patty in a few seconds here, we're going to draw another name. All right. Nothing yet from Patty. All right. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's here. Oh. Patty's here. Patty. Okay. I won't Patty show who the. Here. All right. So, Patty. I'm going to put this person's name. So in case if Patty says she doesn't want this mystery box, the person's name that I just drew out, we're going to... So I said it had a lot to do with what we were doing tonight. So in this mystery box, we have one of the nice fan brushes. We have a mop brush. We have a couple of the dagger brushes in here. We've got the rubber pad, and we've got one of the Amico banding wheels, and we've got several bottles of... Colors for Earth concentrates. We've got black, blue, green, a maroon color, and a brown is in this set. So this is valued at over $100 with shipping. So let us know, Patty, if you want this. Say yay, I want it. And if not, we will draw the next person. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
That might take a minute, so if you want yep. to talk about it. All right. So, so um, we've got, um, I know a lot of you have been waiting for orders, and good news, pretty much every order should ship by Tuesday. We've got a lot of orders going out. Um, tomorrow we actually have FedEx is picking up tomorrow. Our driver today told us he can't take off. Um, because they're so busy and so he is going to be picking up tomorrow. We'll have more orders going out tomorrow, Friday, Monday, and Tuesday. By Tuesday, pretty much everything should ship with the exception of some of the leaf forms. And, and I got an email from them today of what shipped to us today. So while we'll be coming in next week and we figure within about another week after that, we should have most of the leaves to fill all the orders for the rubber leaf forms. It's a U.S. company. They're working as quickly as they can to meet the demand for the rubber leaves, but you guys have really surprised us with, with the leaf order. So I can easily say none of the mystery boxes are gonna have rubber leaf forms in them, um, but I'm gonna show you guys what we've gotten. So all of the, the different mystery boxes that we're gonna be doing, um, and we've got, I've got about a dozen of them here. I'm gonna show you quickly some of these. Um, they're gonna have the contents that I kind of show you and then <clears throat> there's going to be extras in there and so some of the, the says, wonderful thank you all right <laughs> great wonderful so some of the extras that you might find in there like i've got all these bags of stuff and so we've put together kind of some fun stuff there's even stuff like watercolor cakes and watercolor pads of paper brushes jars of crystal glaze um different goodies that are like bonus items and so no two kits are going to be exactly the same but I'll show you what some of these, I'm going to flip the camera down so you guys can see the inside of the box. Like this kit is one that's all different chalking products. So there's chalks, there's brushes for the chalks, there's the different spray sealers, there's the, the white acrylic paint to do it over the top. For those of you who've been waiting for <clears throat> the satin spray from uh, Duncan, the, the satin here, I'm pointing at the gloss, the satin is like the old porcelain spray and there's matte and there's gloss. And so this box happens to have chalks, paint, all the sealers, all the different gloss, matte, and, and satin finish, a whole bunch of really good quality dry brushes. And then there will be some type of a little extra goodie bag that's in there. So most of these boxes will be valued at around $100. So that happens to be the chalk set. Um, the the banding wheel set that we had tonight for the, the live mystery box. There may be some type of a box that has something to do with the banding wheel and some stuff in there. There's going to be mystery boxes with Mako stoneware glazes. There's going to be an assortment of, of stoneware glazes in those boxes. Again, there will be extra goodies in there. Um, this one is a mystery box that's all spray sealers. It's got the new modeling paste. Whoops. It's got the new modeling paste. It's great for repairing. It's, it's a, an icicle type snow texture. It's got a bottle of Mako's No Fire Snow. It's got Duncan's um, OS white and black in there. Again, there will be some goodies in there too that will increase the value of that box. This box may not look like there's a lot in here, but this is a very expensive box. This happens to have Duncan Overglazes, the Fired Gold, the Fired Silver, the Mother of Pearl, the Essence, and then it has a brush for the, the Fired Gold um, and for the Mother of Pearl. And then there will be other goodies in this box as well. Are these mystery boxes going to be $50 also? Every, every one of these will be $50, yep. Okay. And there are, someone asked if it is like in its entirety. I mean, it's like as a set, so like they don't have to purchase the ad separately. No, nope, it'll, there will be, there will be a section in there that are called Black Friday Mystery Boxes that will go live at 7 a.m. on Friday morning, and they are limited. There's limited numbers to each one of these sets, and um, once they're gone, they're gone. We will be putting some new ones up then for Cyber Monday as well, um, but there's a lot of these, so it's not like we're going to run out in two seconds. Um, this And so these sets that you see, these are different assortments, and there will be multiples of each of these. This box happens to have um, a lot of specialty products, things like cobblestones, um, the base glazes, the sculpting medium, white and black cobblestone. There's luster green. There's 
nice greens for Christmas trees in here. There's fired snow. There's non-fired snow. There's black and white glaze that will go with that. And again, there will be other goodies in that box too. To be clear too, they can pick. You can. It's going to have a description of what it is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It'll. So, it'll, so it'll there will be. There will be. Yeah. There will be chalk or, box or Mako stoneware glazes or overglaze kit. Just what like you. What you won't know is what's the extra goodies that are going to be in that box. So this one is a, a box that's all about brushes. So there's gold tacklon brushes, ceramic glaze brushes. Get that in the picture there. There's unicorn brushes. There's mermaid brushes. There's a nice, really nice apron. And then there will be goodies in there. So that one will be called like the brush box. We will have this assortment, which is the right now hard to find two ounce Mako stroke and coat. So this box will have all different uh, Mako stroke and coat colors in it. And we're not going to give you a bunch of dog colors. There will, like I can guarantee every box is going to have black and white, red, blue, green, yellow, orange. Um, and then there's going to be a variety of other colors in there and then other goodies as well. Again, all value that around a hundred dollars. We've got um, some of the colors we used tonight were the Mako UG underglazes. So there's a box of assorted two ounce colors of the Mako UG underglazes. And then there will be other goodies in here too. And this too, you're not going to get a bunch of dog colors. You're going to get a nice assortment of colors. We're not trying to get rid of colors that we can't sell or anything like that. Um, this box is a, is a nice one. This is Mako's Softy Acrylics. And the bonus in here may happen to be some brushes and maybe some spray sealer that will come in there too. So you get a nice variety of acrylic colors. Every box won't necessarily be the same. Get this to go back in here. Um, but you'll get a nice selection of colors and you'll probably always get white and black and some of those basic colors in that assortment. Uh, oh, 7 a.m. 7 a.m. Central Time, yes, I should make that very clear. This box is all about Christmas trees. It has a pint of no fire snow. It has the green sapphire glaze. It has the luster green glaze. And it also has the four ounce bottle of no fired snow and the modeling paste, which is used for doing repairs to bisque. Uh, it's a non-fired product or it's great for making like icicle type drippings of snow on your pieces. So there will be a description for each kind of box. Yes, there will be each box will be listed and then there will be, you know, a description like the brush box and it will show some of what's in there. What it won't show necessarily is in the color kits, every single color that comes in those kits. Oops, this box is missing one bottle of color. There should be a, a couple more in here. I forgot to finish filling this. This one is all crystal glazes. So this will be a whole variety of a dozen different crystal glazes. And so this one will be, you know, the crystal glaze mystery box. And there probably will be, you know, some added things in there as well. And then the last one that I've got to show you is this one is an elements mystery box. So this one will have a dozen different element glazes, things like burner steel and black ice and copper adventuring. There will be a dozen different four ounce bottles of element glazes as well. So those are just some of the mystery boxes that you will see um, Friday. And all of the items that we will have in those mystery boxes are all items that are in stock and they should probably ship out as early as next week because on Tuesday we're going to be all caught up, <laughs> I hope. Um, um, this isn't related to Black Friday or Cyber Monday, but this person needs a particular purple of the Mako Softies. Can they order that one color from you? Yeah, I've got all the, the Softies on the LearnFiredArts.com website are all listed um, individually, so it should be on there. Unless if it's a discontinued color, then we, we won't have it. But I know we've got several different purples. Um, I can't think of all of them. I know Hushed Violet and there's, yeah, other purples that, that are available. Another question, is there a limit? Like, can you buy two? You can, as long as, and the website is set up that it has inventory of what's there. So once it's sold out, 
it will not allow you to order. We can have the option on our website of well, if something's sold out, it'll back order it. We won't have that back order option on any of those things. And we'll make it really simple that right when you go into the website, the first things that you're going to see are all the Black Friday specials. And again, free shipping on anything over $50. So all of these are free shipping anywhere in the U.S., even Alaska and Hawaii. All right. Any other questions? No. Nope. All right, so I'm going to wrap it up tonight. I just want to let you guys know that our lives in December are going to be the auction type lives like we did last year. I'm going to be going through uh, finished samples that I'm not using for workshops anymore. I got to clear some of that stuff out every year. I got to get rid of some of that stuff. And um, we'll have some unique one of a kind type stuff that we'll be auctioning off. Um, during the lives and we might have a little bit of technique but it's the focus in December is going to be pretty much selling type auction type things where you know I've got two of this the first two people to to say they wanted Janine's over there shaking no, her head at me going no no don't do that again <laughs> that didn't work um we'll figure it out I'll, I'll talk to her we'll figure it out so um someone asked if the boxes will be up prior to the sale no they will no. not be up prior to the sale <laughs> I well I I could maybe, I could maybe put them up there, but have inventory at zero so you can't order them, and then change the inventory to what it is. But that would be that would be challenging because it's basically we've got the page set up and we're going to make it go live at 7 a.m. So yeah, you won't be able to necessarily see it. You you kind of saw tonight a preview of of what's here. Um, so just jump on Friday and we'll see. I have no idea how fast some of them will go. We might be sitting with a bunch at the end of the day. I don't know. So, um, all right. So Jean, just looking to see if there's any other questions. But I want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. Um, be safe. Have a good time. And um, hope to see you guys ordering on Friday. Um, if you need any of the stuff that we used in the live tonight, it's all available at learnfiredarts.com. So take care. It was good seeing all of you. And we will see you again in December. Hold on. I just want to answer it, I think. Oh.